We're wrapping up today, and what we've been doing the last two weeks, now today as well, is looking at how the book of Isaiah has been used in the Gospel of Matthew. Uh, I mentioned briefly, didn't spend a whole lot of time on this, won't spend a whole lot of time on it today, uh, that over time there's been kind of a debate over the basic structure of Matthew's Gospel. Remember, he doesn't write in chapters and verses. So the question is, how does he write? Did he have a plan? Is there an organization here? Are there places along the way uh, you can see it? And uh, over the years, uh, since questions like that became a concern, there were two basic theories that kind of warred with each other, and there were modifications of each of those two basic patterns. Won't go into that. Uh, one of them is the geographical plan. Uh, thinking that Mark wrote first, that Matthew followed Mark's plan, that Mark had a geographical plan. Uh, the idea being that you move from the start of Jesus' ministry to the end of his earthly ministry, and that necessarily is going to put you in a geographical go from Galilee to Jerusalem and somewhere in between. Not that Jesus spent the whole of his early ministry in Galilee and then only the last week of his life in Jerusalem. John's Gospel gives you uh, Jesus in Jerusalem primarily. Of course, it starts with Cana in Galilee, uh, but you've got a lot of scenes with Jesus in Jerusalem. In fact, we get the standard dating of Jesus' life from John's Gospel. Luke tells us that Jesus was 30 years old when he began his public ministry. John tells us about three distinct Passovers in Jerusalem, uh, the last, of course, being the time uh, when Jesus uh, dies. So you've got to make room for at least three Passovers in John's Gospel for Jesus. Not that there couldn't have been more. John himself tells you he didn't tell you everything about Jesus. The whole world wouldn't be able to contain the books that could be written. But you've got to make room for at least three years of public ministry of Jesus. That's where the standard uh, dating comes from. So he dies about 30 A.D., somewhere in there. He was born uh, B.C. Somebody made a mistake along the way, so the calendars are off. So he's born <coughs> uh, B.C. and dies about 30 A.D. Uh, Paul's converted about 33 A.D. That gives you kind of basic New Testament uh, chronology. So anyway, one idea is that Matthew followed Mark. Mark has a geographical plan moving from Galilee to Jerusalem uh, with a section in the middle of Jesus on the way there. Luke certainly follows uh, that plan. He's got a long middle section called the travel narrative, uh, Luke 9 to 19. Uh, so he has kind of a basic geographical plan. So that's one idea of how Matthew put it together. Uh, the other is, uh, as I pointed out, there's five collections, big collections, of Jesus' teaching, all of which end with a standard formula. That's, that's a good literary marker, okay, when words get repeated. So at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, and when Jesus had finished these sayings, uh, after the missionary discourse of chapter 10, and when Jesus had finished chapter 13, <clears throat> and when Jesus had finished these parables, uh, so you get a little marker at the end, and so five major collections. Matthew's got all kinds of resemblances to the Old Testament. It looks like Matthew is giving us a new Torah, a new law of Moses, because Jesus is presented as a greater than Moses. Uh, th that was introduced by, by, the, by the name of Bacon. The other is uh, most commonly associated with a more modern scholar by the name of Kingsbury. Uh, so you've got the Kingsbury theory of geographical plan. You've got the uh, Bacon theory of the five books. And then I introduced you to uh, an article that came after I had written my commentary on Matthew, a guy by the name of James Patrick. He teaches at Oxford. And he believes that Matthew's gospel is uh, a piece of Jewish, in his case, Jewish Christian literature, but modeled on Jewish literature, which moves through Old Testament quotations, putting them together so as to bring out the meaning of the Old Testament. And he thinks there are ten major quotations from Isaiah which have been placed strategically throughout the book, and that that 
is Matthew's basic literary plan. That the ten sayings of Isaiah. Now, all these theories face some kind of counter objections that come where their theory doesn't quite seem to give you all the explana explanatory power you're hoping for. Uh, I'm rather inclined to the idea that Matthew is a very complicated writer, and it, it's kind of like uh, a, a piece of woven cloth with designs in it, okay? Uh, so you start out with a basic piece. That's kind of your geographical plan. We're going to go from the beginning of his life to the end of his earthly life. That seems pretty simple. Okay, so that puts down your basic line. Then you weave through another thing. So you put in the five major discourses so that you get the image of the law coming out there. Uh, and then you take another layer in there and you put in the Old Testament quotations, not just from Isaiah, because there's more than just Isaiah. He thinks there's 10 major Isaiah quotations, but he's got to admit that two of them are closer to Zechariah than they are to Isaiah. But they are Zechariah passages that he believes, a good case can be made, is that Zechariah is interpreting Isaiah. <laughs> I'm not going to argue with that. <clears throat> uh, I'm going to give you the two Zechariah Isaiah quotations quickly. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that, because i got five to do today. And I probably only got time for three. Uh, but I want you to know what the ten are in case you're interested in going back and looking at the tapestry of uh, Isaiah, uh, Isaiah in uh, Matthew. Okay? The, um, the ten Matthew uh, citations Matthew 1, 22, 23, that's the virgin birth. Isaiah 7, 14, if you're taking notes. Uh, Matthew chapter 3. Uh, this takes you to the uh, beginning of uh, the ministry of John the Baptist and introducing uh, Jesus through that. And that's the uh, quotation from Isaiah chapter 40, verse 3. The voice crying in the wilderness, etc., prepare the way of the Lord. Chapter 4 in Matthew, verses 14 to 16. That is the quotation from Isaiah 9, 1 and 2, which begins Jesus' public ministry in Galilee, and Matthew tells you it begins in Galilee because that's what the prophet Isaiah said. People who walked in darkness would see a great light, and it's in Galilee of the Gentiles. All right, that's the first three. Matthew 1, 22, Matthew 3, 3, Matthew 4, 14, and following. And the passages in Isaiah, chapter 7, 14, chapter 40, verse 3, chapter 9, verses 1 and 2. Last week, we looked at two of them. Chapter 8, verse 17, after you have the Sermon on the Mount, chapters 5 through 7, you get a collection of miracles, 10 miracles. So, surprise, <laughs> uh, another great biblical number. So you got 10 miracles. Actually, you got 10 miracles in three sets of three. So, well, how would you get three sets of three? Well, one miracle gets tucked inside uh, another, as is uh, standard uh, for that particular story. That's the, uh, the woman who... Uh, intercepts Jesus along the way when he's making his way to another healing and she touches him secretly in the crowd. Uh, that story always appears in the middle uh, of that story. So you got three sets of three uh, with one tucked uh, in the middle. So, well, why is that a big deal? Uh, well, if you actually look closely and if we took the time, the ten plagues of Egypt fell in three sets of three. <laughs> uh, so it's thought that after Jesus gives you the new Moses with the Sermon on the Mount, as Moses gave the law on the mountain, then you get the ten miracles of the new age uh, as Jesus ushers in uh, the messianic uh, kingdom. Again, I'm not going to uh, take further time. But in the midst of the healings, uh, we get a quotation uh, from Isaiah 53, a final servant song, uh, that <clears throat> by his stripes we are healed. Okay, so in the midst of the he many healings, the ten healings that are given, in uh, chapters 8 and 9, we get a quotation into Isaiah chapter 53, tying, as we talked about last week, our physical healings to the atoning work uh, of Jesus. Then in chapter 12, in the midst of controversy with the Jews over more healing, in this case primarily a, uh, an exorcism uh, of a demon, uh, he cites the first servant song, Isaiah chapter 42. So in chapter 12 of Matthew, verses 17 to 21, you get a quotation of Isaiah 42, verses 1 
to 4. All right, so those are the five that we've covered uh, right now. Okay, here are the remaining ones. All right, I'm going to give them to you in order. We're not going to cover uh, them in order. But the uh, next one comes in the collection of parables, chapter 13. That's the third great discourse. In the midst of it, he quotes from Isaiah, chapter 6. So in chapter 13 of Matthew, verses 14 and 15, you get the quotation from Isaiah 6, verses 9 to 10. And we'll talk about that one uh, in a little bit. Then in chapter 15, again in controversy with the particularly the Pharisees and scribes over the adherence of Jesus and his disciples to the traditions of the fathers, not the law of the Old Testament, but the interpretations of the Old Testament that were bound up in the traditions of the elders. Uh, chapter 15 in Matthew, verses 7 to 9, you get a quotation from Isaiah, chapter 29, verse 13, and we will look at that one. Then in chapter 21 of Matthew, verses 4 to 5, you get a quotation. This is the uh, well-known passage of the entrance into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday, Jesus riding upon a donkey, and the quotation comes from Zechariah, chapter 9, verse 9. But there is language in Zechariah 9 which is reminiscent of Isaiah chapter 62, verse 11. <clears throat> we'll look at that very quickly. Chapter 21, verse 13, uh, controversy in Jerusalem uh, over the driving out of the money changers from the temple. Chapter 21, verses 4 to 5. Excuse me. Chapter 21, <clears throat> verses 13. Well, we're giving you a the 4 to 5. Chapter 21, verse 13 echoes Isaiah chapter 56, verse 7 about the temple being a house of prayer. We will talk about that one. And that also has language that resembles Jeremiah 7, 11 about making the temple a den of thieves or a den of robbers. And then the final quotation is in chapter 26, verses 31 to 32. That's about striking the shepherd. All right, that seems to be more directly a quote from Zechariah, chapter 13, verse 7. But the word for striking uh, the Lord Jesus also comes in chapter 53, verses 4 to 6. All right, that's James Patrick's list of the ten Isaiah quotations which structure Matthew's gospel. I say it's, for me, it's kind of the third level of weaving. All right, let me... Just discuss very quickly the two Zechariah quotations. The first of those is in Matthew chapter 21, verses 4 to 5. This took place to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet. This is one of the fulfillment statements. All this took place to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet. We have ten of those uh, in Jesus. And the quote comes almost word for word, out of Zechariah 9, 9. Say to the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a beast of burden. And we have language similar to that in Isaiah chapter 62. At verse 11, Behold, uh, chapter 62, verse 11. Behold, the Lord has proclaimed to the ends of the earth, Say to the daughter of Zion, notice the echo there of Zechariah 9, Say to the daughter of Zion, Behold, your salvation comes, not your king comes, <clears throat> bringing salvation, but your salvation comes. Behold, his reward is with him and his recompense before him, and they shall be called the holy people, the redeemed of the Lord, and you shall be called, sought out, a city not forsaken. Uh, Patrick's claim is that Zechariah is, like Matthew, writing out of that which came before. <laughs> that in his prophecy, he is taking passages from Isaiah and using them as he speaks. All right? I'm just mentioning that and moving on. The second one of those is in chapter 26. And this, of course, pertains uh, to the crucifixion of Jesus. This is the strike the shepherd passage. Chapter 26, 
Verse 30, And when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. Then Jesus said to them, You will all fall away because of me this night. For it is written, I will strike the shepherd, and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. But after I am raised up, I will go before you to Galilee. Uh, that echoes Zechariah chapter 13, verse six, uh, 7. We'll look at that uh, with you. Uh, but the image of striking uh, the Lord Jesus Christ, same verb is used there. And so Patrick believes that is really an Isaiah quotation, though it's mediated through Zechariah. But I won't say any more about that. Let's go back uh, to chapter 13, verses 14 and 15. This is into the section of the parables. Matthew doesn't give all the parables of Jesus in this section, but he does give a lot. The whole chapter, which is a long chapter, is devoted uh, to parables, and it has uh, the ending. Uh, it actually comes a little bit before uh, the chapter break. It has the ending, which is the standard uh, formula, chapter 13, verse 53, and when Jesus had finished these parables, he went away from there. Uh, so we have a, uh, uh, a collection of parables. Some would say seven, some would say eight. Uh, why would some say seven? Well, it's a very attractive number in the Bible. <laughs> uh, and the last one uh, is, is, you might say, is a, is a weak parable. I actually think it's, it is a parable, and it is actually a parable which is key to understanding the Gospel of Matthew as a whole. This is, after all, the middle discourse. All right. Oftentimes in the Hebrew, the meat is in the middle. Uh, and in this case, we get the parables of the kingdom. And the last parable in this collection is Jesus says to his disciples, have you understood all these things? That, that seems to be a transition passage. That's why some say, well, it's the seven before that. Have you understood all these things? They said to him, yes. Uh, I might have thought that was a little premature. They seem to have <laughs> misunderstood a great deal. But actually, Jesus seems to accept uh, the answer here. And he says, Therefore, every scribe who has been trained for the kingdom of heaven is like a master of a house who brings out of his treasure what is new and what is old. What is new and what is old. Every scribe who has been trained for the kingdom of heaven brings out of his treasure what is new and what is old. Some believe, I'm one of them, that this is actually an autobiographical portion of the Gospel of Matthew, is that he is explaining to you who he is and what he has done. That in his Gospel he has repeatedly been giving us that which is new, that which came to pass in the life of the Lord Jesus Christ, and what is old, showing us how that which is new had come out of that which is old. Augustine had long said before that the Old Testament is in the New Testament revealed, while the New Testament is in the Old Testament concealed. So you have hidden away in the Old Testament the story of Jesus. That's why there's just one way of salvation, whether it's Old Testament or New Testament, it's all through Jesus. It's just that in the Old Testament, they were getting Jesus through, to use the language of Hebrews, or even Paul in Colossians 2, copies and shadows of the real thing. Jesus is given to you in the full light in the New Testament. In the Old Testament, you see his silhouette, you might say. It's a shadow of the real thing, but you don't get the fullness of his face. You don't get the intimacy of his details, but you are seeing the outline of his life in the Old Testament. All right, so that's, I think, what Matthew is doing here. I think that isn't a uh, parable, but it's, it is uh, explaining what the Gospel of Matthew does and what he, as an author, does. Now, it's in the midst of this that he gives us the explanation of Jesus for why he taught in parables. And this is a passage that oftentimes gets overlooked. It's easy to make a mistake on this. If 
If I were to ask you, why did Jesus speak unto I won't ask anybody to do this because the standard answer I get, I'm going to reject. Okay, so I, I, I don't want anybody to be made a fool of uh, here. Uh, if you were paying for this privilege, I would probably do that. <laughs> uh, that is, uh, you paid me a tuition fee uh, for it, <clears throat> but we won't do that. But the standard explanation, why did Jesus speak in parables? Well, the answer is, well, these are down-to-earth stories with heavenly meanings. These are like sermon illustrations. It makes it a whole lot easier. It'd be like preaching uh, a passage about Jesus caught in the storm and using the movie The Perfect Storm. <laughs> Spoiler alert, if you've... <laughs> been to the first service, you know that's what happens today. It, it's a perfect way of bringing out, as it were, the feeling of what was going on in John 6 when they get caught in the storm. So you get a real life story of down to earth, but then you get the spiritual meaning of it. Okay, That's why Jesus spoke in parables. He used the parables to bring a heavenly meaning, a spiritual meaning, into down to earth living and so on. And that is exactly opposite to the explanation he gives. Isn't that surprising? That's because you and I have always dealt with in the church, not parables, but explained parables. Explained parables are different than parables. Okay. If this morning Dr. Stewart got up in the pulpit and told you the story uh, about the perfect storm, the movie, the book, and so on, what's the name of the ship, the Anita Gale or something? Uh, if he had told you that story and said, go home and think about that. And out the door, they go, oh, what was that all about? I came to hear a sermon, all right? This guy's telling me a sea story. That's what Jesus did with the parables to the crowd. And this happens in Matthew chapter 13, not Matthew chapter 4, when he first begins his public ministry. When he began to teach in parables, things had developed to the point where there was hostility growing and plots were arising. And so the disciples come to Jesus, Matthew 13, verse 10. Then the disciples came and said to him, Why do you speak to them in parables? Now, uh, all we have is the printed text here. You're not hearing the tone of voice. But I think if you'll read carefully, you will see the disciples did not find this good news. Because the disciples are somewhat like session members. People that have complaints about the preacher, go talk to the session members. All right? And they expect the session members to tell this and solve the problem with the pastor without the pastor ever knowing who it was that had complained. And some elders can get the idea that's fundamentally their job. They just pass on the complaints. No, no, no. You go through life, as Dr. Connect used to say, an elder is always carrying two buckets in the church. One has gas, one has water. Okay? You run into a fire, use the water. All right? You don't want to be putting gas on the thing. You handle the problem. Don't just be carrying it on and bringing complaints to the session and say, why does the pastor do this? Uh, you handle the problem. You support your pastor. <clears throat> Those the disciples have come to Jesus. Why do you speak to them in parables? What's all this about? And his answer is, to you, to you disciples, it has been given to know the secrets of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it has not been given. For to the one who has, more will be given, and he will have abundance, but from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. That is why I speak to them in parables, because seeing they do not see, and hearing they do not hear, nor do they understand. Indeed, in their case, the prophecy of Isaiah is fulfilled that says, You will indeed hear, but never understand. You will indeed see, but never perceive. For this people's hearts has heart has grown dull, and with their ears they can barely hear, and their eyes they have closed, 
lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and turn and I would heal them. The reason he spoke to them in parables is that this was an act of judgment against them. Why? Because they hadn't paid attention to what had been told to them. They had heard it, they had heard it, they had heard it, and they had stopped up their ears, they had closed their eyes, they had refused to hear, and so they're being handed over to their blindness and to their deafness. That was Isaiah's ministry. He was coming to prophesy to a people that were not going to listen. And so that's why, kind of midway through the book, not quite midway literarily, chapter 40, that's why Isaiah it comes to a point where God tells him to seal up the prophecy. Because what's coming next is for way down the road, generations down the road. In other words, the verdict has all better been rendered on this generation. They will not hear. They will not repent. God has come to the end with them, and they will be carried off into exile. It is what the theologians call judicial hardening. It's what happened to Pharaoh. Because Pharaoh would not repent under the word of God and under the miracles that came. His heart was hardened. He was hardening it. God was hardening it. His heart was being hardened. All of that is going on at once. It's both Pharaoh hardening his heart and God hardening his heart. But God's not hardening his heart by pouring cement into it. God is hardening his heart by giving him more light, more revelation of his power. And uh, Pharaoh, in order to hold on to his sins, has to close his eyes all the harder, has to stop up his ears all the more, so that the truth will not break through. So he's at last handed over to his hardened heart, and judgment falls upon him and upon his nation. If we come to church year after year after year, listening, 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 just coming to church, and not paying attention, the day's going to come when you're not going to be able to hear. God will just turn you over to your deafness. You've heard and you've heard and you've heard and you've refused. And God does run out of patience. He sometimes hands a whole generation over to the consequences of their sin. And that's what's happening here. That's why the disciples come. You know, all of a sudden, this teacher who has had wild acclaim, people are coming from all over to hear him, suddenly are saying, what is all of this? As I told you, it only gives them parables. He comes in the room, he says, a sower went out to sow. And as he did, some seed fell upon the path, and birds of the air came and snatched it away. And some seed fell among the thorns, and it grew up and it got choked out. Some seed fell on the rocky soil. It didn't have much root in it, so when the sun rose, it withered away and died. But some seed fell on good soil, and that reaped 30 fold, 60 fold, 100 fold. Thank you very much. Out the door he goes. I said, I thought you told me this guy was a religious teacher. Well, he is. Well, we got this letter, lecture on farming, and it's not a very good one. He said, if this guy doesn't take any better care of his seed than that, no wonder his farm is failing. All right, he's letting it fall on the path, the rocky soil, among thorns and whatnot. He, if you're a farmer knows what you're doing, you put it in good soil to begin with. You don't have it scattered abroad indiscriminately. And out there he goes, but... The disciples are unlike the crowd. They come later in the chapter and they say, tell us the meaning. Tell us the meaning. And Jesus says, okay. The sower is sowing the word of God. And the soils that are out there are the ways in which people respond to the word of God. Some people are like just hardened paths. Seed falls upon them. Birds of the air come and snatch it away. It never has any impact in their life. And some people do hear, but they're like rocky soil or they're like uh, plants in thorns. Uh, there's response, but it doesn't survive persecution. It doesn't survive the cares and concerns of this world. It gets choked out because they're more concerned about other things. It's only the good soil that will bear fruit. You know, a sermon that you hear on a Sunday morning is like a meal being served up. 
And while you're in church, you get to smell it. Right? You get a little taste. But you don't digest it unless you go home and think about it. You go home and turn on the ball game or something else right away, and you just move off into the activities and recreations of the day. If there's no effort made to digest what you've heard, you just lose it. It's gone. It's serving a meal, but it's not eating a meal. It's walking into a banquet, smelling it, getting a little taste, but you never sit down to enjoy the meal. So these people, having shown, they really don't have a taste for the good food of Jesus. They are just given parables not explained parables. You see, the explained parables came only to those who had enough gumption in them to go and ask, to find out. So if you go home and you're not sure what the preacher had to say, what do you do? You ought to ask somebody. <laughs> you might ask the preacher. You might ask an elder. You might ask a Christian friend who's got a little more uh, mileage down the road than you. You ask somebody, what did that passage mean? And because you make the effort, effort, because you pray to God, say, God, I didn't understand that sermon. What is there in this sermon that I needed? Then when God gives the meaning of the sermon, it sticks with you. It sticks with you. All right, that's chapter 13. Now chapter 15. Verse 1, Pharisees and scribes came to Jesus from Jerusalem and said, Why do your disciples break the tradition of the elders? For they do not wash their hands when they eat. Okay, They were under COVID restrictions back then. <laughs> you had to wash your hands every time you eat. you got to wash them for 30 seconds. Right? You've got to do it with a good antiseptic soap and so on. You gotta, so they had all the traditions that they had to do. And the disciples of Jesus weren't being taught the tradition of the elders. Now, they were being taught the Holy Scriptures. But the scribes and the Pharisees had a lot to add on to the Scriptures. And they were more concerned about the add-ons than they were the Scriptures. And, of course, Jesus goes right at it uh, for them. He says, yeah, and why do you disobey the Word of God? Because you've got a tradition that allows you not to take care of your father and your mother because you say that all the money you have has been devoted to God. So you have taken all of your earthly wealth in the present day and you have put it in a living trust so that when you die, it will go to God. In the meantime, of course, you can do with it what you want. But when you die, it will go to God. And since you've devoted it to God, you can't use it for your mom and dad who need to move into a nursing home. And Jesus just thought that was horrible. And he goes at it with them. And so in this uh, passage, uh, he, he lays down the law. All right, <clears throat> chapter 15, verse 7. You hypocrites, well did Isaiah prophesy of you when he said, This people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. All right, so we go back to the book of Isaiah, we will see that Jesus has used the words of Isaiah to make his point here. Isaiah, though he lived 800 years before this, was speaking to the situation that Jesus was facing. Isaiah 29, verse 13, And the Lord said, Because this people draw near with their mouth and honor me with their lips, while their hearts are far from me, and their fear of me is a commandment taught by men. Therefore, behold, I will again do wondrous, wonderful things with this people, with wonder upon wonder, and the wisdom of their wise men shall perish, and the discernment of their discerning men shall be hidden. They honored him with their lips. They taught as doctrines, commandments of men, not the word of God. And a close examination would show they were actually violators of the Word of God, though outwardly they seemed to be zealous for the Word of God, but they were in fact zealous for their own traditions. 
like tithing, mint, dill, and cumin. Matthew 23 gets into that. Do you know how you tithe mint, dill, and cumin? You go out to a restaurant before you salt your food, shake a little bit into your hand, you take it, you throw it over your shoulder. That's an offering to God. He loves it. He loves to see people throwing salt over their shoulder. <laughs> and making that a religious offering. Loves to see it. That's how you tie. Mint, dill, cumin, whatever. You have various ritualistic ways of doing these things. Uh, I think I've told some of you this. Uh, I've got a sister who's... Uh, uh, well, she's a pianist, but she's got other artistic interests, and one of them was learning how to cook. So uh, she was single. She would go away on weekends uh, and, and take these classes with these famous chefs, you know, and learn how to cook up a big meal. And uh, I'd invited her to come with us to the beach one year. Uh, she said, is that near Charleston? I said, yeah, it's about 45 minutes from Charleston. She said, we go in there to a restaurant. Sure, you want to go to Charleston? We go. She said, well, there's a chef down there by the name of I can't think of it right now. He's on TV. Uh, anyway, she said, I took a, a, uh, a seminar with him in Kansas City. And uh, uh, Chef Bob Wagner. Yeah. Uh, I took a seminar with him. I'd love to go there. I said, all right, we'll go there. Uh, so I looked it up. Where is Chef Bob Wagner in Charleston? You know, you Google it. And I found out, well, yeah, he's at the main restaurant in Charleston. <laughs> he was right there in the middle of the Omni uh, Hotel. And I called her back, and I said, yeah, I found him. She said, well, let's go. And I said, well, it looks to me, and this was, I don't know, 15 years ago. I said, it looks to me like it's going to be $50 a plate just to get out the door. She said, it doesn't matter. I'll pay for it all. Said, all right. <laughs> then we go. So we signed up. We got down there. And while we're having this meal, and uh, let me tell you, it was worth $50. <laughs> it was worth every, every bit of it. Uh, while we're eating there, <clears throat> the guy next to me uh, says to his wife, where's the salt? I can't find the salt. And I thought, well, this guy doesn't have any salt. So I looked at our table. Well, there's no salt on my table. There's no pepper either. I looked at the next table and the next table and the next table. I said to my sister, I said, you know, I think Chef Bob Wagner thinks he knows how this food ought to taste. He doesn't want people messing with it, <laughs> uh, which was true. <laughs> when the meal was over and we were getting ready to go, she had to go to the ladies' room. The ladies' room door was right off the doorway into the kitchen. Uh, and as she's coming out of the restroom, a waiter is going back into the kitchen to get something, uh, evidently uh, in a matter manner of disgust, and he blows the door open, and he said, Oh, my, there's a man out there who wants A1 steak sauce. <laughs> you got the impression that that was the ultimate blasphemy <laughs> of Chef Bob Wagner, that you would take his steak and you would cover it with A1 steak sauce. Well, the scribes and the Pharisees were covering the rituals of Yahweh with A1 steak sauce. They tied mint, dill, and cumin, but they were violating the law of God. And Jesus exposed it for what it was. And what they were doing, Isaiah had talked about 800 years ago. This people honors me with their lips. But their hearts are far from me. They teach as doctrine the commandments of men. All right, the last one, <clears throat> chapter 21. And this is a suitable place to end, even though it's not at the end of the gospel and it's uh, not uh, uh, on the... Uh, uh, crucifixion of Jesus or the resurrection that are yet to come. But this, uh, this event uh, coming early after uh, Jesus has entered the city in many ways uh, takes us uh, to the end of the Bible uh, and the consummation of God's uh, plan. So chapter 21, Jesus is coming into the city. Uh, and we read at verse 4, this took place to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet, saying, Say to the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, humble uh, on a donkey and on a colt, the foal of a beast. All right, there's the Zechariah 9, the entrance of the city. The king is coming uh, into the city. All right. Uh, once he gets in there, uh, verse 12 says, And Jesus entered the temple 
and drove out all who sold and bought in the temple. And he overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold pigeons. He said to them, It is written, My house shall be called a house of prayer, but you make it a den of robbers. And the blind and the lame came to him in the temple, and he healed them. But when the chief priests and the scribes saw the wonderful things that he did, and children crying out in the temple, Hosanna to the son of David, they were indignant. And they said to him, Do you hear what these are saying? And Jesus said to them, Yes. Have you never read out of the mouth of infants and nursing babes you have prepared praise? And leaving them, he went out of the city to Bethany and lodged there. Confrontation in the temple. What is going on in the temple? He doesn't enter the temple into what we would call the main building. Okay, He doesn't go to the Holy of Holies. He is, after all, not a descendant of Aaron. He's not the high priest. He doesn't violate the law. He's not even a Levite. He descends from the house of Judah. Now, he is a priest, but he's a priest after the order of Melchizedek. He enters the outer court of the building. Okay, And so we have the court outside where the sacrifices are performed. And beyond that, we have a court for the Gentiles. This is a, an enlarged version of the temple that uh, Herod had uh, built over 46 years. John chapter 2, this temple took 46 years to build. That was Herod uh, that did all that, this big and large. I mean, it was a fantastic complex. You remember the disciples looked with awe on it as they went up the Mount of Olives later that week. Uh, and Jesus gave them the discourse uh, from the mouth of all of <clears throat> They're in the court where pigeons were sold. Who would buy pigeons? The poor. And Jesus says, my house is to be called a house of prayer. You have made it a den of rock. And after he chases everybody out, who comes? The blind, the lame, and he healed them. That's what the temple is all about. I mentioned some weeks ago when Solomon dedicated the temple, got all these musicians, got all this choir, going to have all these sacrifices, big altars, whatnot, but Solomon's prayer concentrates on one big thing. What is it? Prayer. His long prayer is a prayer about prayer. If your people sin and they get hauled off into another land and they there remember their sins against you and they turn and they pray toward this house, then hear from heaven and answer their prayer. If your people have sinned and the sky holds its rain and so there are no crops to be found and your people recognize their sin and they turn and pray toward this house, then hear from heaven and come down and answer their prayer. It is to be a house of prayer. That temple was to be a gigantic satellite dish which would beam our prayers up to heaven and receive heaven's response to come down. It was the communication device between heaven and earth. It was the touch between heaven and earth. It was the place where God was manifest to his people in the biggest way. And they had turned it into a den of robbers. They had stolen the court of the Gentiles. They had stolen the purpose of the temple. They had turned it to their own advantages. And Jesus was having none of it. He cleansed it all. That temple was the foreshadow of the end of the Bible. The new heavens and the new earth, the bride of Christ, the great announcement of Revelation 21 is, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men. He will dwell among them, and they shall be his people. And God himself shall be with them, and he shall wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall no longer be any death, neither mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for all the former things have passed away. That's where the Bible ends. The Bible started with a wedding. The Bible ends with a wedding. <laughs> the last wedding is Christ coming to receive his bride, his bride descending out of heaven in all her glory. And they are happily joined together 
to live happily ever after. And prayer is kind of the embodiment of that. And that's what the temple was all about. That before the end comes, before the day you stand in the presence of Christ and you no longer have any need, his house, his dwelling place among his people was to be your refuge and strength. And they had taken it all away. They had made it into a place of blasphemy. They observed the commandments of men rather than the law of God. They cut off the access of prayer. They made it a den of robbers rather than a place where people could come and find acceptance with God. He still has a place of acceptance. You draw near to him in Jesus Christ. And wherever you be, as far away as you get, if you'll turn and face that place, that Jesus Christ, he will indeed hear from heaven and come down and be with you all the days of your life. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Our God, our Heavenly Father, how we thank you that all these things that came to pass in the life of our Lord Jesus Christ had been announced so long before so that when they came to pass, we could know that it was you, O Lord our God, the Savior of his people. Be our Savior now. Help us to worship you in spirit and in truth, to put aside all earthly idols and cling only to the God who has made himself known to us in Jesus Christ. For we ask it in his name. Amen.